Welcome, everyone, to the Witness Underground podcast. I'm Scott Homan. This is and we, today we have Anthony Mathenia, who is going to be talking about a comic graphic novel that he's worked on called Lucky about crime bosses. And I'm sure you have a better pitch for that and how it relates to a movie that is called Dope Men, uh, which is on Amazon and you can stream it out. It's a great documentary. And he's the next witness and he's going to talk about his journey out and the community that he's found on the outside. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing very well here in the Ozarks. Uh, it's a beautiful day. We escaped the, the heat a little bit. So I don't know. It's really nice right now. What is this project you're working on? And it sounds really exciting. So, yeah, what, uh, what uh, has recently been released is a graphic novel. It's a biographic novel about uh, the old crime boss that some people know about, Lucky Luciano. It was a 10-year project, more or less, of uh, putting together the comic book. Uh, and not only that, getting all the extra oh, wow. resources and writing all the articles and stuff that go along with it. So... It's a lot more than just a graphic novel. Uh, it's about 100 pages of comic. And then beyond that, we've got tons and tons of additional uh, nonfiction uh, content just talking about Lucky Luciano and his place in, a, in America history. Amazing. Yeah, I, I'd never actually heard of the guy. I respect it was like it's an introduction, like a prequel to the Narcos series with about Pablo Escobar and the Mexican Narcos. I feel like it's like, well, if you if you go back 80 years, there's another history that started that or played a role. Exactly. Um, a companion to the the graphic novel of Vice Versa is this um, documentary that we've got out. It's called Dope Men, America's First Drug Cartel. And that's one of the purposes of this of the documentary. Uh, a lot of people hear the the war on drugs. They think Nixon. They think Reagan. They think, you know, just say no. But the war on drugs actually goes back to, you know, the early 1900s with these these guys like um, Lucky Luciano, Legs Diamond, Arnold Rothstein. That was the start of the war on drugs. And it's um, you can't really understand Mexican cartels or, you know, the crack epidemic in the inner cities and things like that without a properly understanding in the context of where this all started. And where it started was with these uh these uh, Godfather, Goodfella types like Lucky Luciano. Incredible. And what role did you play in it? And how do people read it, watch it, get involved? What's the state of the, f the project? <laughs> 10 okay. years is a long time. Yeah, well, the graphic novel, it took a long time to produce. Um, we're really happy to see it finish. But what kind of was cool about it is the, uh, the documentary Dope Men came much later within the last, you know, three years or so. And as part of the uh -huh. making the documentary, um, one of the things was we got the idea that we could take the individual panels of art that we already had in the Lucky comic and then animate them and kind of freshen them up and bring them uh, to be part of the documentary. So a lot of the art that you see in the comic book is is the same art that's in the, in the documentary. We just got it moving and, and stuff like that. That's really cool to have to have a documentary that's sort of built off of a graphic novel that's based on reality is is something I've never actually heard of before, I don't think. And then one of the things about it, you know, that was kind of cool. I mean, just it wasn't just me working on the comic book. It was at least 10 other people who never thought they'd be part of a documentary either. So everybody gets a big kick out of get that IMDb credit and, you know, seeing your name. Yeah. At the end of a documentary, I mean, especially the yeah. team on the documentary, uh, Yevigny, who did the art for it. You know, he really he really worked hard. My, my role in the comic book was simply editor, color, letterer, jack of all trades. But a lot of the other people like Christian Cipollini, who wrote it, and then Yevigny, Francis, he did the, the art. And, you know, those guys were the real, real heavy lifters on the project. So. It's cool to see see their work yeah. out there like this. If folks want to check out the documentary, it's called Dope Men, America's First uh, Drug Cartel. That's available on Amazon, Apple, Google Play, YouTube, uh, wherever you want to rent and or buy it. And then the uh, the graphic novel, we have a, a collector's hardcover edition that's available on Amazon. Uh, you can also check out the Kindle version. If, you, if you're on that Kindle program, I forget what it's called. You can read it for free. 
and what's Kindle cool, Unlimited. Kindle Unlimited. And what, what you've got is like where you can click on the panels and it goes from panel to panel to panel. It's very, very fluid. It's a real cool way to read it. So that that's also available on Amazon. And then we'll have a, a, a paperback trade mm-hmm. coming, coming later down the road for that. And that comic's called Lucky. That's great. I think that'd be perfect for a little Kindle or a, a screen that can do one panel at a time. Yeah. I was struggling it, it, to read it on a PDF on my phone. I'm like zooming oh, yeah. in and scrolling over. And, yeah, <laughs> no, they've, they've really got it cool. I think it's called panel view or something like that. It's really, really fluid, almost cinematic, really. If you put your comic book together, it, it just really flows nicely. And it's a real cool way to read it. <laughs> and like I said, if you're on that Kindle Unlimited program, you can you can check out Lucky by Christian Cipollini and Yevigny Francis uh, for free. Or it's part of your Kindle program. Amazing. That's great. Uh, you'd mentioned that there's going to be an event coming up in December that you're yeah. going to be doing what a number four talk at. <laughs> oh, potentially doing a number four talk. I still got to work it out. Um, what it is, is that we are going to be screening the Dopeman documentary at the mob. Let the car go by at the mob museum in Las Vegas on December the 14th. So if you're in the Vegas area and you're into mobsters and want to check that out, uh, the director, Seth Ferrante, will be there. The uh, the writer, producer, Christian Cipollini will be there. I maybe be there. I don't know. Like, I gotta re- I got I've been living in the woods, so I got to figure out, you know, do I want to jump from the woods to Vegas? Because even as someone who was in society, <laughs> Vegas kind of ranked really, really low on my list. But what might might twist my arm, I'd like okay. to give a, uh, like I said, a number four talk about the history of of crime comics and really like um this is another thing is like today we think about comics as just being superheroes you know the avengers spider-man batman but that's not how comics started in this country there was a time when crime comics was the number one seller uh, on the shelves but then what happened there was a lot of government censorship the comic book code came in and it really took a uh, a starting out art form and just basically crippled it where the only stories you could tell back then were these kind of cheesy, you know, corny superhero type stories. And that became, you know, the dominant thing in American culture. Uh, but with a, with a comic like Lucky, it's kind of a, a way for us to go back to the roots of, of kind of where this all began and kind of give a homage to those early crime comics, but also bring it up into a new era uh, by making it r- really historically based, lots of fact based, you know, it's 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 very detailed to the point that I call it a, a biographic novel because it's really like reading a biography. So that's the talk I'd like to give yeah. there. Talk about you know that transition, you know, the early days of crime comics, what happened, how they gave rise to the superhero genre, and then where we're at the present time with with crime comics. Yeah, I wanted to read something that uh, Cipollini wrote. He said, I had to make sure that, that the lucky graphic novel was done in a way that captures both the spirit of the true crime story and also be able to reach the high standards expected of the graphic novel realm. And he had two goals in mind when starting the project, to keep it true in the crime part. And I really I like that because I've never actually thought of a graphic novel or a comic as something that could be conf- related as a, a documentary. Based yeah. on true stories, but maybe even the actual true story. When when I got involved in comics, I wasn't coming to it as one of these guys that, you know, was a hardcore comic collector. Yeah, in the 90s when I was a teenager, I read the X-Men or whatever. But it was only later in life, extra, after I got out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that I was looking at the next thing, thing I wanted to do. Because I was kind of ticking off boxes on my creative bucket list that was, you know. So I'd published a couple of novels. So I got that out of the way. Okay, I'm, I'm a novelist now. What's next? And the thing that's always interested me was filmmaking. But when you get out of the witnesses, you've got no community. You've got no one to work with. And, you know, you know what filmmaking is. Mm-hmm. You, need, you need somebody to How hold, old are the, you hold, in, hold the boom. I'm like 29, 30 in this time period. At this time then. when you left the religion. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was trying to make up for lost time. I mean, like, I was like, oh, I should have been all doing this all in my 20s. But yeah, you probably would have been a grip in your 20s, <laughs> at least on one project before you realized exactly. what you wanted to do. Right. Craft but services, if nothing else. <laughs> but like so that didn't happen. So I was thinking about filmmaking and I was right. like, well, that, that <laughs> exactly. seemed like a, that seemed like a big hurdle for where I was at in life at that time. 
So I was like, you know what I could do? I could make a, a comic book script and I know I could probably find like and one artist somewhere that will draw this thing for me. So I really just immersed myself in the world of comics, learning it, learning how it works and, re and reading folks like Alan Moore and Grant Morrison's, you know, some of these kind of more literary type guys, Neil Gaiman, who also did comics. And what I found was it was a tremendous, I mean, I really enjoyed the way it could be used to tell a story. But yeah. the thing that kind of felt like it, I was like, well, this is great. You know, yeah, you can tell a, a Superman story this way, but you can tell any kind of story this way. And right. so that was kind of the pitch in meeting Christian Cipollini. He was like, you know, he wasn't a comic guy, but he was a writer. He'd written uh, nonfiction books about Lucky, and he knew he knew the history of Lucky forward and backwards. And it was like, OK, man, let me let me help you turn this into a comic. And and that's how that process started. It's really cool. It's like an extreme then, storyboard. You ever do a storyboard for a yeah? You ever that's do a storyboard for a it. visual art or a video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never actually thought of it that way before, but it's basically doing the storyboards, and then when you see when you see the art, the comic panels in the documentary, you know, it's basically not totally, but making that jump from storyboard to you know animated. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoyed it too. I imagine right. when you're putting it together, you start to see something like, yeah, we could reveal this terrible situation, you know, on page 100, or we could drop the audience right into that moment. And I felt like that's what happened. Like on the second page or the first page, there's a guy who's beat up and we don't know why. And neither do the cops. And he won't say anything. You know, it's like, you're yeah. sort of just like dropped into the scene. Everything's already unfolding around you and it's immersive. Yeah, that's how you got to think about it. And one of the things I like in comics to like haiku poetry and that on the comic page, you've only got a certain amount of panels you can put on a page. And, you know, each page has to have like a beginning, a middle, an end, a cliffhanger. You know, you always want to end the page on a cliffhanger before wow. you keep people turn to the next that's page. So ask. it takes a lot of, of a thought to construct yeah. this thing. It's not just throwing pictures and words on a page, but it has to have a flow it has to have a beginning, middle, and end. And like in the case of a comic book, you've got 24 pages to work with of story and, you know, maybe six to nine panels per page. And, you know, if it's a heavy dialogue page, it's more panels. If it's big action, it's less panels. So it's just it's just an interesting way to put your mind towards a, a creative way of telling a story. And I'll, I'll say it again, not just any story or not just a superhero story, but any story. Mm -hmm. I feel can be turned into a comic book or a graphic novel, maybe not a financially successful one or a marketable one, but it is a tremendous way to, to tell stories. Yeah. I, I was very impressed. I, I would love to know more about your journey. Um, so you had a list of things you felt like you missed out on. So you're playing catch up. Um, I don't know where you want to be in that storyline, but gotcha. go ahead and uh, let us know more about that. No, it's just like, I don't know, like a lot of people, I would say that were raised um, as Jehovah's Witnesses. Every time in my life that I tried to go out there and do something creative when I was a Jehovah's Witness, you know, A, I had to keep it on the down low. So, you know, this elder wouldn't get offended or that elder wouldn't get offended. and then. Um, and, and invariably someone would find out or my parents would find out what I was doing and it was nothing like really edgy or bad. It was just being creative. So it was always getting shut down. And I remember talking to my dad, telling him how I wanted to write a novel. And he's like, Oh, maybe instead you should think about, uh, learning how to become a welder. And you know, there's nothing wrong with being a welder. It's a fine profession, but that just wasn't me. So when I got out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I was determined, like, try to make up for lost time. I was going to ask, like, you, the reason why we know each other is, is because you were in a band called Six After Two. That was a band you did with your, well, your creative partner. Like a light switch on a wall, this common sense goes on and on. Well, that's not all he believes he's every girl's dream. He's Mr. Tough Guy.
that was within the witness religion, right? And then it you was. knew everybody, or you connected to the people that, are, that I made the Witness Underground documentary about. Like, I, I learned about you. I'd never met you, I don't think. I might have, we might have run into each other at the October Ridge that we feature in the film, but mm -hmm. um, we bumped shoulders. I don't there, think either of us remember that, but it was me trying there, to use your music. And I reached out to your old bandmates, and they're like, you're going to have to talk to Anthony about that. And I was like, where is this Anthony guy? And so I was doing like a huge internet search for your, for who you are. I found a bunch of comic stuff, but it was some things that looked like that had been started and then were sort of not, they're sort of like nothing was happening. And I think it was like six months before I ever, maybe even a year before I actually got a reply because you were off in Arkansas doing wood stuff in the woods. <laughs> That's how I understand it. But um, anyway, six after two, the music connection and like the connection to my movie, I was trying to like, at some point I was trying to conclude your music in the film. So <laughs> yeah, like, I was that what you're talking about when you're talking about your dad and like people oh, in the yeah. religion? I mean, that's just one example. I mean, there was many, the time I was in the school play, you know, the time I wrote my first short story, the time I got really into hip hop, uh, art and graffiti someplace, you know, it was just like, just little stuff like that. But the band stuff, you know, it was a a similar story to you know everybody in the documentary in that you know music you could play music a little bit but it had to be in your basement you know we want to play out and and, and oh we can't play here because it has alcohol but it's a restaurant but it still has alcohol you can't play there so it was just you know that's just another example of how you know we had to do stuff but it was kind of on the you had to be quiet about it. You had to keep it on the down low. And that's what I mm -hmm. thought was so tremendous about being invited to play at October Ridge was that it was so unusual and unique for me because, you know, it was it was celebrated there, at least in that that little community of I don't know how many people were at that October Ridge, 100 people, maybe. But, you know, you were cheered, you were celebrated, people enjoyed yeah. what you were doing. And, and like Eric, says in the documentary you know it was very very special and i'm glad that we got to connect after the fact um the reason i connected with you is i just found out about the documentary and watched it and was blown away it was like wow i was like wait a minute i was there <laughs> but you know music was just one example of it <laughs> you know uh, one example of many so when i got out you know my big thing was i, I i'm a writer so i wanted to publish novels and so I wrote a couple of uh, cathartic uh, XJW novels. Could you go into that? Like what, what were the general themes? So the, the first novel I wrote was called Paradise Earth Day Zero. And that book's very, very grim. Uh, it basically takes the idea that everything the Jehovah's Witnesses believe is going to happen in the future actually happens. But let's put a main character in that situation. You know, what's it like to actually go through an Armageddon when people are dying? What's it like yeah. to be having to clean up the bodies of the dead? You know, because I read uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, where he talks about having to do that after the bombing of Dresden, Germany, and it, it was hellacious. But according to the witnesses, this is our happy hope for the future. And so for me, it was just like, okay, let's take these beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and make them real. What would this really be like? So um, anyway, that book is very, very grim. It's called Paradise Earth Day Zero. I follow that up with Happiness, Next Exit, which was a very, very sweet story. I was trying to cleanse my palate, and I was kind of in the phase of like, oh, yeah, being a witness sucked. But there were some good things about it, you know. And it was kind of a, a more balanced, nuanced approach. Um, it's, a, it's about a young girl growing up in a rural congregation in Missouri, um, just getting into adulthood and, and figuring out who she is, what she wants to do, what she wants to be, but kind of having that rule really controlling Jehovah's Witness community to deal with. And so that one's called Happiness Next Exit. Um, they're still available on Amazon through the old publisher. I have the rights back to both of those books. Oh, cool. So my plan is to republish Happiness and then potentially continue the Paradise Earth story, which I sat away from my own mental... Uh, well-being because i didn't want to be in that headspace for a long time but it, i'm kind of at the the point where I, I feel like i'm ready to revisit it and this is, you said a third book uh no, i think <laughs> exactly. it's a great idea one of the things that i love about uh, the witness underground channel is because it does focus on 
ex-Jehovah's Witnesses getting out and doing creative things with their life, be it, you know, dancing or or music or art or writing, whatever it is, you know, I mean, whatever your passion was as a witness, I mean, I think everybody's experienced that not being able to do it to the fullest extent possible. One of the greatest gifts we have in no longer being witnesses is that we can pursue these things, even if we're in our elder years of life, you know, there's still time to do that. And I think I'd like people that are just getting out to understand, you know, there is life ahead all these dreams you had on hold, you are now free to pursue them. And if you do put in the work to pursue them, you can accomplish them. That's just how this works. Right. Yeah. It made me think just now, like when I was working on my band, ADD Chronicles, and we changed it to waking life for when I was like doing the witness music thing. And when I was 2021, 20, I was really passionate, but it was, it was one of the things almost like using your language. Like I wanted to check off the box. Like I wanted to be a rock star when I was a teenager. Okay. So I was in a band and I played some graduation parties and I played some bars and it was fun. I realized it wasn't exactly my passion, but when you pursue music as an adult or you pursue writing or graphic novels, it's like a, you're in a different headspace. When you're 20, you're like, it would be so cool to be and fill in the blank. And you try it and you might not know what you're doing. You might half-ass it and then move on to mm -hmm. something else. But like when you do something as an adult, you actually have this advantage of having understanding how the world works, understanding a bit more how business works, understanding how to make connections and, and like make some movement that's not just like a half-assed attempt at something, which is what I felt like I was more doing at that time in my life. Or now I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it properly. And I feel like maybe that's another little positive message. Like even if you're older... It's okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, it might be better. Yeah, you have some advantages, right? Exactly. I mean, like, our backgrounds have given us some st skills, like um, Ryan talks about in, in the doc, you know, this DIY mentality that was very much a part of Nuclear Gopher. You know, you know, creative people can collect skills within the Jehovah's Witnesses, even without the advantage of, you know, art school or university education. But then when you get out into the world, that gives you the opportunity to network and meet the, the people that are going to help you take this to a, uh, you know, to the next level. Like, I don't care if you're writing a book in your basement, you know, to get it out, it's a collaborative effort. You know, you need editors, you need cover artists, you need publishers, you need all sorts of things. So, you know, being able to have that big pond, no longer that small kingdom hall pond to draw from, you know, you meet the right people that are going to help you and work with you to bring things to fruition. The, it was, it was always a thrill. It's like, Oh, it's our first time going on a radio show or something like that. Oh, it's our first time going to a comic convention and, you know, trying to peddle our wares, you know, Every little thing was just like so exciting for me because I was doing everything I always wanted to do, but could never do, you know? And so that was the mm -hmm. thrill. You know, and I did want to talk a little bit about that, that comic creator community stash, because that really helped me yeah. a lot. Where are they based? Because, and what do they do? And when did you get involved? Uh, well, Sorry I got involved with them. I, I got involved with them maybe like, let's say three years, two, three years after, after I had, I left the witnesses and really, you know, when you leave, especially for someone like myself who was raised in, you know, you've got no more friends, you got no community. In fact, you don't even know how to like go out and make friends that much because you know, the, what do you know about talking to worldly people and stuff like that? So what happened was I got interested in making comics. It just so happened there was a local comic book creator club that was starting up in, in this area of, <clears throat> called Edwardsville, Illinois, this little shop called Heroic Adventures. And just walked in one day with a bunch of other people that just walked in. And we, you know, kind of bonded and, and, and learned how to make comics together. Uh, we decided we'd make a little indie publishing house for our comics uh, called stash publishing uh, we went from there to like doing comic anthologies and working with hundreds of uh, comic creators not just in, in the United States but all over the world there's 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 only a couple continents that we we never worked with anybody uh, from or maybe even just one continent we never worked with anyone from that'd be Antarctica 
but and then we started publishing other people's graphic novels. We were, you know, going around to all these comic conventions, touring like we were rock stars almost. You know, we'd hit all the big cities, you know, Kansas City and stuff like uh, Charlotte, North Carolina was another good one. But, yeah, we just kind of went all over, you know, touring. And, it, you know, part of it, I think like Eric says in the documentary, you know, the music was just an excuse to maintain friend relationships. Stash kind of making comics was an excuse for us to to all be friends and all be buddies. And like, you know, I'm still close to many of those people today. And, you know, it was, it was a, it was kind of transformative for me. And then it gave me my first real friend circle outside of, of the witnesses. I look back on it now. Why did I really like it? I think it had that kind of nuclear gopher feel to it. You know, this ragtag bunch of misfits, you know, we're going to do this stuff. We're going to get together. We're going to take on the world and, 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 you know, I'll do all this cool stuff. So I was really yeah. thankful for it. But as you talked about, you know, it was me being, um, I guess early thirties at that time. And, you know, all, everybody else in the group was in, you know, in the early twenties, you know, you know, I was a whole decade mm -hmm. ahead of them, but you know, it worked out and we got to do a lot of, a lot of cool, fun stuff together, you know, which, in many ways, we, we put out a lot of good books, but in many ways, it was uh, the camaraderie, the friendship, the, the creative community, all, the, all that parts of it, to me, was probably the most valuable part of it. Yeah, that's really cool. I actually had something similar at the same time of age, and I think we're about the same age. I'm born in 81. Um, I, when, I, when I left the religion, I got into a band right away. And I was living in, well, I was, I was traveling. I traveled with my girlfriend after leaving the religion for like a half a year. And then we came back to Colorado and I joined a band and I was like, yeah, this is the thing I've been missing because I did this through my teenage years and twenties. And then after, after like a year of that or half a year of that, we threw house shows and stuff. Then I moved to Vietnam and it was like, okay, new chapter. But in Vietnam, I met all these musicians. And then I really found a community there that like I fell into that made, felt like home. And it was a similar thing. It was like, well, you guys are making music. I, I was making music, but I was like, but you guys are serious. And I'm just sort of like playing. I'm like catching up on old times. It's like out of almost like out of nostalgia playing covers. <laughs> yeah, and then right. I was like started filming them, which is what gave me all the skills was like filming these people that became my friends. And a lot of them became my friends because I was filming them. And just, I was just like practicing the camera work. And I kind of had a similar thing. Like it didn't even matter if I, it mattered that I liked their music and it mattered that I liked them or that we liked each mm -hmm. other. Um, and it was just like everything else came natural after that because we were hanging out with our friends trying to help elevate each other's art to another status. And it was awesome. Yeah. It's kind of a similar parallel story, right? Right. Like someone, if you're growing up in the witnesses or you're, you're part of the witness organization and you're a creative person, you know, you might be the only one in your, your kingdom hall or even in your circuit that writes books. You know, you might be the, one of a handful that paints or something like that. You know, you're in a small group that's into music and stuff, you know, you don't, but oftentimes you're, you're alone in what you're doing. Um, but you know, when you're out, like I said, it's, it's a, you're no longer in the small pond, you're in a big ocean and, you just have to find other people that, that share what you're into and, you know, bond over that, you know, and, and like you said, elevate each other and, and elevate your art and, you know, learn and, and collaborate. And that's one of the things I liked about comic making. It was, it wasn't just, you know, me as a writer or someone else as an artist, you have someone who colors the page, you have editors, you have someone that puts the book together, you have someone that does the little letter balloons and the sound effects you know, it's a big collaborative thing to, to produce a comic in, in similar ways, you know, like a documentary film or something like that. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I feel like I made the documentary alone because I did this huge amount of it. But when you look at the credits, it's mm -hmm. obvious that it was like every time someone else got involved, it made it better. And it wouldn't be right. as good or as at the high level or probably wouldn't have gotten into any film festivals. And we got into 11, six worth mentioning, but we got into more. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's because people saw it and they're like, you know what? I could help you make it better. Here's the thing that I see that I could do. And especially one great example was a graphic artist out of Belgium. He saw some stuff we were doing, I was putting out and he reached out to me. And it was like, for me, it was like, 
dude, the film is done and now you want to change something. Oh, and then real? he's like, yeah, but you know, these parts just like bring it down to like YouTube quality. And I think I could do something to make it better. And he did. His name's Klaus de Luz. He's like, let me take some photos and let me do some graphic work. And let me like, oh, I got an idea to make these CD covers look really pro. And he did his graphic work. He took his own photos and he like did some blending. And those became like the shots of all the CDs. Like it was just like a really like, this is a JPEG of the CD art. And now it's like okay. someone holding the actual CD for almost all but one of the CDs. And, um, you know, like that little, that little thing and that kind of dedication and that interest to be a part of it, mm -hmm. it goes so far to bring the quality level up. Oh, for sure. Like and I tell, I, I tell people, I tell people that are wanting to be writers or want to write a novel or book or something like that. It's like, yeah, you can do, you can write all day long, uh, but you get an editor involved. They will help you make the book, you know, Maybe you don't have the art or design skills, you know, find somebody that does and, and, and give your book a good cover and stuff like that. I'm, I just, I'm really into collaboration and, you know, cause I've seen how it elevates and even like with what we're doing now with the, you know, the books I'm helping with, uh, with, uh, Gorilla Convict publications or the, the documentary work I'm doing with Outlaw Films, there's always this push to make it better. It's like, okay. You know, we did some light animation for the first Dope Man, America's first uh, drug cartel with the lucky storyboards <laughs> or comic panels. You know, next time, can mm -hmm. we have more movement? You know, how can I learn After Effects better? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I was going to ask it's you part, about it's part of a team team effort. And you've got everybody in the team saying, OK, this looks great. The next one has to be better and just always pushing each other yeah. towards that goal. Right. And then just the idea of using your comic graphic novel panels in the movie and adding movement. That's a really cool idea. And then, yeah, it's like you learn, you learn how it works and you learn what you, how you feel about it. And the next time I'm sure you'll be like, well, we know how to do that because we did it for a whole movie. Well, how well, we, we actually, do we ourselves? Right. Yeah. We're actually talking about taking the whole comic and animating it and putting it on, on Seth Ferrante's true crime YouTube channel, which I don't know. We're talking about it. I got to get in and see how tough or how hard this is going to be. But, you know, I, I actually I actually want to get more movement in it. And just everything you do is a learning experience for the next thing. You know, making yeah, the comics exactly. was a learning experience for the documentary. And, you know, now with the documentary, it's going to be a learning mm -hmm. experience to step into, like, you know, doing uh, more animation and, and, and learning better graphics and stuff like that. So we can really, you know, plus up what we're trying to do. It's also a nice thing to think about is like, yeah, I made a, I want to make a documentary one day in my life, but your first documentary is not going to be your best documentary. Probably. I, and the, my prototype for a documentary was this one about music in Vietnam. And it was, mm -hmm. and I knew I kind of went into, it, I was like, I just want to make something cause I want to learn. I want to do a whole, the whole thing from beginning to end. Can I do that? I've done seven minute things on five minute things on 10 minute, like, you know, the longer it is, the harder it gets. And the more times you have to change little things, but. Um, and then there's many, many interviews. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, each thing leads to the next thing. And I think it's good to realize that, like, I've been obsessing with perfectionism on this documentary because for me, it's a super important documentary, but now, now like making a short doc is like, oh yeah, I would, I'll do that this week. You know, I'll make something, <laughs> I'll pump out a, a couple podcast episodes. Cause that's, that's the easy stuff, <laughs> you know, but that could be like someone's hardest thing at some point. And, and we're always leveling up and I have another documentary idea, you know, um, I want to I want to ask you about Gorilla Convict Outlaw Films and Fathom mm -hmm. because at the end of the credits you have these three logos on a panel, and okay. you just mentioned Outlaw Films. Um, how um, who's who are they? How are you involved with them? Uh, so Gor uh, Gorilla Convict is um, an Outlaw Films. That's Seth Ferrante. He's the head of the the Outlaw Film Studio and the head of uh, Gorilla Convict Publications. Okay. Seth, Seth's had an interesting story that's been covered in Rolling Stone. It was featured on, on the Vice TV show, I Was a Teenage Felon. Uh, but the short of it is, um, when he was a young man, I think early 20s, 21, 22, he, he went to, um, well, he was charged as an LSD kingpin in, on the East Coast. Uh, he faked his suicide, went on the run for two years, finally was apprehended, ended up going to prison for 21 years as a first-time nonviolent offender Whoa. for LSD distribution. 
So pretty serious uh, sentence. Wow. You know, this was the height of the war on drugs. And, and you know, when all these mandatory minimums were coming in uh, for drug offenses, and he was kind of on that first wave of, of people that got locked up, you know, for marijuana and LSD on a very, you know, very, very long sentence. But his story to me has always been inspirational because while he was locked up, he started a writing career. Um, first, it was writing little articles for prison journals. Then it went to where he was writing a column for Vice while he was locked wow. up in national magazines. Um, he started writing for Don Diva, writing for Feds, writing for Real Crime UK, just all these places. And then he started a wow. publishing house, Guerrilla Convict, while he was incarcerated. And started writing books That's about amazing. basically the people he was locked up with. Uh, this is in the early days of right? hip hop. Must be you know, so many gangster stories. Come, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gangster raps coming out, and people are name dropping these 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 hood legends, these street legends. You know, like Wayne Perry, like Frank Matthews, like Supreme. And he's like, "Wait a minute, I'm I'm locked up with these guys. You know, let me tell you, let me tell your stories because there are no books out here about you guys." And he ended up publishing 21 books from behind bars. Um, That's amazing. Because you, know, you see in TV, I, like the, the oh, sorry, like the PI coming to visit a prisoner and then having like a 20 minute conversation and like, that's it. And they write a book about this guy they met across the table in chains. And that's what you see in yeah. TV. But I never thought about it from the other side. Like you can get pencils and paper in prison. That might be the only things you can get. <laughs> So yeah. interesting. And you can also, and also get, the rise of hip hop does an incredible tie. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, would, I would say he was in the, the wrong place at the right time, something like that. But yeah, it worked <laughs> out for him. Yeah. Um, you know, he had to go to the hole a couple of times because of his prison writing. You know, he was writing about injustices within the, uh, the system, you know, the injustices and then the racist nature of uh, the war on drugs and things like that. Um, but he, you know, I, I, his story resonated with me. You know, I've never been locked up. I didn't serve 21 years in prison, but I did do 21, 29 years or so as a Jehovah's Witness. And, you know, I could relate to having his <laughs> exactly. creativity on hold, you know, because like, yeah, you can write books yeah. in prison, but his, his passion's always been wanting to become a filmmaker. And so when he got out, that's when I met him. Um, he was very enthusiastic about doing comics with me. I was enthusiastic about wow. doing comics with him because, like I always said, you know, like I feel comics are a great medium to tell all sorts of stories. And he already had all these true crime books and things like that. And guys he was working with, like Christian, you know, let's let's start making comics. But then since his release, you know, he kept to his goals of becoming a filmmaker. And that's what Outlaw Films is, is his own film studio. Again, he. He made those connections in prison where he was writing a guy named uh, Rick Hershey Jr. or Rick Hershey Jr., who's better known as White Boy Rick. Um, there was a Matthew McConaughey movie made about White Boy Rick. And then the opportunity opened up for Seth to work with um, a director, and they made this documentary called White Boy. Um, during the pandemic, when everyone's on lockdown, that documentary, White Boy, went Netflix top 10. Like not just documentaries, but top 10 wow. of all Netflix. And that opened Whoa. the door for him to really pursue and start getting these documentaries like Dopeman made. So Outlaw Films is is Seth Ferrante. And then what was the other one? Fathom Studios. Um, that's Fathom, um, yeah. yeah, that's his editor for that Dopeman project. He's, he's got several editors he works with, but that's okay. that's uh, Levi Barnes of, of Fathom Studios. Uh, was the awesome. was the editor on the on the project? That's so interesting. So you knew about him when he was incarcerated, and you tried to meet up with him after, and that was successful. And now you're working together. Uh, kind of, sort of. Um, I had a mutual acquaintance who was in a halfway house in St. Louis the same time Seth was, and okay. this guy had, had had brought me some you know uh, postcards and books that Seth had written and given him, and he's like, "Oh, you got to meet this guy." I can tell he's going to do things in life because that's just Seth. If you talk to him or listen to him on any of the podcasts he's been on, he's incredibly driven. And so, yeah, we met at, at the Schlaff. I I got his number. We met the the Schlafly Brewery there in St. Louis, and you know, really started talking about working together. Um, and you know that, like I said, Lucky, you know, was on and off to make that comic for about ten years. But within the last two years, since this filmmaking things blowed up for him. 
you know, he gave me a call and said, Hey, I need somebody to handle uh, the book publishing thing for me with Gorilla Convict. Mm. And I was like, okay, once a publisher, always a publisher, I guess. And so it was a, it was really a nice thing because it's, um, it's online work. It's allowed me to pursue my dreams to live in the middle of nowhere and, and, you know, hide in the woods and, and really pursue my creative (laughs) dreams. Cause like, that's great. Wow. I mean, there was, there was a time in my life where, you know, I, there, I think there's a GTFO phase of leaving the witnesses. Um, you may have experienced that with Vietnam. I tried to do that with Asheville, North Carolina, which, you know, has a reputation of being a creative place where a lot of people are doing creative things. But when I got to Asheville, I realized that the creative things people were doing were creatively trying to figure out how to juggle uh, two jobs and four side hustles to pay rent and creatively trying to figure out how to uh, drink between said jobs. And it just didn't <laughs> it didn't allow time for a lot of creativity, you know, even though it was a very creative place filled with a lot of unique and interesting people. So just having this opportunity to work mm-hmm. with Seth and be able to work exclusively online and, you know, be able to just be in the woods kicking it with rabbits and chickens and, you know, my MacBook and, and doing doing things, you know, it's it's it kind of feels like, OK, I, I finally made it now. I've got a lot of check boxes to, to tick off on creative endeavors, but just being able to say, OK, I'm a professional now at doing this and yeah. it's not just not just a side hustle or not just a hobby. Right. That's amazing. Congratulations, by the way. That sounds like a dream life for a lot of people. It's a dream. You might not life get rich doing it, but no, you're living no. it. And like that's more important. Like you have time freedom, right? And you're doing things with your time that are resonate, like in your aligned with your values and desires. Exactly. Uh, my wife Andrea, she's an artist, and you know she was in the same position. So we just happened to have a piece of property that we had bought in the Ozarks, and you know we were looking at you know being bartenders some more, um, you know, paying, paying rent some more. And then we just decided, you know, that, will that make us happy? And it was like, well, let's just move out to the woods in a tent. At least we'll have time to paint. At least we'll have time to write. And, you know, we're no longer living in a tent, but like, you know, we paid our dues and we, uh, you know, we're very happy with what we're doing. Who's this guy? <laughs> so I was going to talk about, uh, happiness, which I followed Paradise Earth with real quick, is like, like I said, Paradise Earth was very, very grim. It was a cathartic novel, me working out all my feelings with about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Happiness ne- Next Exit started as a joke. I wrote it during a National Novel Writing Month, where you basically write a novel in a month. Not a very good novel ever, but, you know, they can become one eventually. But I just <laughs> wanted to just do something silly. So I was just like, I'm going to do a Jehovah's Witness romance novel. <laughs> and just imagining what that was going to be like, you know, oh, she she saw the flex of his J.C. Penney suit as he extended his arm with the boom mic. <laughs> I want to I want to I want to become a three stranded uh, cord with you <laughs> and just like all this stuff. So I had written this this, you know, this the silly first draft of a Jehovah's Witness romance novel. And I was under contract with a publisher at the time who published my first novel and they were asking me, okay, when's the next one coming out? When's the next one coming out? And I was like, oh, I don't have that, but I have this one, thinking that they were going to be like, okay, this is great, Anthony, but not really what we're looking for. But instead they said, oh, we love this. And then I was like, oh, shit, now I got to make this into an actually good book. And so <laughs> happiness, you know, it started out as a joke. In the end, it became a very, very sweet novel, a very heartfelt novel, one that I can't see myself writing again, but I'm, it's weird, but that one turns out to be the one I'm most proud of, even though it's, you know, it's written as kind of a a new adult style novel, but it's, it's just a sweet story. Uh, And it's not so overly grim towards the witnesses. It's like, oh, there were good times too. We went to the district convention and it was a lot of fun to get a half frozen Danish and then all the way frozen orange juice, you know, to go out to Red Lobster, you know, the fancy place to go to New York for the first time. And, you know, it's just the Midwestern JW experience. (sighs) You nailed it. You nailed it. 
Keep and going. Like, that, that, was just, that was the fun stuff for me. I mean, I was just throwing stuff in there that made me joyful. I mean, I even, I mean, don't sue me, Reed, if you're listening to this, but I included Pop Riveter lyrics in there and didn't, you know, didn't say <laughs> Pop Riveter. But I had that, I had the lyrics to that song about showing love and stuff. And, you know, I wrote this from the perspective of a 21 or 20 year old uh, female, but like, in many ways, it was this, my story. It was the story of uh, me and my my ex-wife, Rebecca, um, you know, getting out of the witnesses, really, like getting some new ideas, you know, and, and trying to go into the congregation and showing love and then just getting that pushback on it, and, you know, that eventually lead to uh, dismissal, disfellowshipping. But, you know, I really like that one. That'll be the first one that I am republishing. And yeah, I'd be happy to have it a part of, you know, whatever you guys got going on because, you know, it's, it's not anything I'm looking to make money off of, but I think it's a sweet story and I think it will, it will resonate with some people. I, I want to jump in and say, I've been thinking about this for a while. I'd like to create like a creator's circle or like a private group for people, musicians, artists, authors, because there's so many things and it doesn't have to be, we can make a super tight one, but we can also make a broad open one. But the idea is like people might come out of the woodwork to support and have an idea or like ha- want to do graphics for you or something, you know? And there's a few people that came to mind just when you were telling the story of happiness and how funny the perspective is, um, or at least the inception of it is, is three people, Henry Gilroy, who wrote the star Wars, the clone wars animation series. He's mm-hmm. an ex witness. I didn't he showed know up for a film festival huh. and he, he's been at star Wars for years. Like he has an amazing job there and um, really, really nice guy. And then Bonnie root is an actress in LA. They're both in LA. And I met, she came out of the film festival as well. And she's doing, she had a pilot short, but she's turning it into a feature right now. And she's super connected. And I mean, just, she's been so in the industry talking, forever. Maybe so, we're doing a movie. The, you know, three of us as a as a creative team here, we take Anthony's script, Scott's directing, I'm gopher, and and then <laughs> get some connected people to know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, those, those two people have their own script that they're working on. They're both related to the Jehovah's Witnesses. So one is a post-apocalyptic, Henry Gilroy's, I'm not, I'm not sure how much I can give away, but like something about a post-apocalyptic, 1975 related period oh. piece oh, and nice. then hers is more like about abuse and um, she did a pilot short that is now used in like education world about how um, predators function and she's doing wants to do a feature and she has like name talent in her short and anyway it's like super exciting because that stuff's all like coming soon and I've met some younger filmmakers who are doing some shorter stuff on related to the topic. They're not necessarily like the witnesses. Let's get them. But like Henry's is more on the on the nose about it, where hers is more like some one of the characters is or some people in the film are um, also a period piece in the 80s. Interesting yeah, I think, stuff. I think that's awesome that people are doing stuff. You know, and that's just what I've always been about is like, you know, finding people that are are creative. And, you know, how can we how can we team up to make to make things happen? You know, I meet I meet yeah. young kids today that they're not Jehovah's Witness, but they're in their own little cults and stuff like that. And like, I promised every one of those kids, the first novel you write, you bring it to me. I will I will pro bono edit it. I will help you put a cover together. We will get it out because I just have a heart for people, you know, that are trying to do stuff with limitations. And once you're out, I, you know, I think we need to do what we can to support support each other. And what we're doing, not just for our sakes, but for, you know, the next next younger generation that's coming out so that they, too, have opportunities. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. It's really nice that you can offer that. I, I was thinking of when I fir- when I first had the idea to make something on this topic of shunning with Witness Underground, I had this feeling like it was this gigantic mountain of a project that would be so hard to even wrap my head around. How would you do it or what it would be? And it was like that for years. But knowing that there's people who are willing to give advice um, and and people are, I've met so many people, whether they're super connected or just like a novice, um, just trying for fun. Like people are always willing to like chat about it. seems a lot of people are really often willing to chat about it, at least if not like support it. It's really cool that you offer that. Did I tell you I wrote a a film script once when I was a Jehovah's Witness? 
<laughs> you did not? Yeah, you sent what me a it? copy of that. Yeah. It's so cringe to read it right now, but it's also awesome. it's honest. Uh, you know, it was, it's written. It was called um, it's called Truth, I think. Yep. And it was about like you know being being a young Jehovah's Witness, going to um, you know skating rinks and going to house parties, and then the most traumatic thing in life is when someone decides to leave the truth. And, uh, yeah, it's very cringy. It's the best Jehovah's Witness drama that was never made. I'll say that. <laughs> I almost wish the Watchtower would make it. But, you know, it was... It, it was Send just, it up it was, and see if you can get it on JW.net or whatever, you know? Right? I would TV. love to see them do it, but, you know, they'd butcher it. <laughs> because it was, it was too honest for what... You know, we were all good Jehovah's Witness kids. You know, we were pioneering or whatever, but, you know, whatever there is... You go to a party in the city with the the quote unquote city witnesses we called them. You know that kind of had looser standards than the rest of <laughs> us. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you guys had that in Minneapolis, but like the St. Louis witnesses, you know, they could you know do whatever they could do and not get into trouble. But we were we were in the uh, the the more outskirts, and you know our congregations were stricter. You know that sort of thing. So yeah, true. Kind of funny <laughs> thing. Truth, look for Truth. that at your next next district convention. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look around on the nuclear gopher shelves. I'm pretty sure it's here somewhere. <clears throat> right? It's there was so this cringy. little. Oh, you're gonna leave the truth. You're gonna leave the truth. But it's honest, and I respect <laughs> its honesty. I mean, I called it truth, and it was truthful to what a what a a 21 year old Jehovah's Witness was going through. To That's speak awesome. to the double standard, there was this like hangout after school hangout place called Cons in my hometown, and like the downtown strip, and they had video games, pinball, sodas, and burgers, and it was all really cheap. And it was like people leave high school, walk to Cons, hang out for thirty minutes or an hour, play games, play the one pool table, and then like I went in there twice with my high school buddies, and some new elder got into town. He's like. You were seen walking into cons. You have something to say to you for yourself, and I was like, I could be walking into any building on the planet with my friends. Like, why is that yeah. a problem place? <laughs> I hung out with those people for eight hours a day for the last four years, and then like I go to Minneapolis, and it's like the witnesses are hanging out at the bars after every meeting, and I was like, well, What's the difference here? Like, we're all hanging out with strangers. <laughs> And everyone is is drinking. So, like, I was, right. I'm going to a sober kids only hangout with the same people I just went yeah. to class with. Anyway, what I thought it was shocking and God. refreshing I'm... in Minneapolis to go to the bars, <laughs> post meeting bars. Everyone needs a drink after going to a meeting. Oh, we used to take Tuesday <laughs> nights. We would head downtown to downtown Minneapolis and go to Brit's Pub for the Brit Pop nights. Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was so much fun. Like we would like Wait, Brit quick... Pop night. <laughs> yeah, they had Brit Pop night, and cool. so um, they would like have a DJ playing all the Brit Pop. This would have been late '90s, early 2000s, and uh, we used to go down there and like it would literally like get. We'd call other people at other congregations. Okay, after the meeting tonight, Brits, and we would drive into the city from out out the outskirts, out in Apple Valley or Lakeville or whatever, just so we could go hang out. And then we'd like shoot pool, drink martinis, and listen to brick pop music for like hours, and then almost lawn get arrested bowling. on the way home. Uh, and lawn bowling. Yes, there. Were, well, we never. I never did the lawn bowling. Other people did. I That's did, the weirdest did. thing about that place. I've never seen it's, it anywhere else in the world. But they have this huge rooftop, and it's a lawn, and you can roll balls on it. And it's like a version of British bowling on the roof at Brits. We Pub. probably <laughs> didn't do that because we were only there at night, and it just never yeah. sounded like a good idea to go outside. But it's like playing cornhole. I remember British coming <laughs> coming home from coming home from there one night with my uh, roommate was driving and he was he had had a lot more to drink than I realized and we got pulled over when he blew past a cop about ninety miles an hour and the cop pulled us over did a sobriety test didn't didn't give him breathalyzer but he walked a line and he's like how far away do you live and then he's like get home safe and we got home and I was like man that would have wrecked the entire night at Brits. If you would have gotten a DUI, man, we would have been in so much trouble with the elders tomorrow. <laughs> like uh, ruins your life for a year. <laughs> um, but I wasn't even worried about us like getting ticketed or crashing the car. I wasn't driving. I didn't realize, you know, but like it was just, oh, we can get in trouble with the elders. 
and then we don't we don't get to go to Brits anymore after the meetings because they'll, they'll clamp down. <laughs> Well, that was always a thing. It was always you were just waiting for the other shoe to drop no matter what you were doing. And, you, you know, like like the, the guys that were athletic, you know, that would arrange soccer games or something. And, you know, they'd all be having fun. And then inevitably it'd be like some local needs on the spirit of competition. And, OK, no one can play soccer anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like whatever it was, it was only a matter of time before some, you know, something happened. That was maybe not exactly witness kosher, a little borderline questionable or something like that. And it gets shut down, you know? Yeah. So. If there wasn't adultery or a crime or child sex abuse or physical abuse, there was going to be some other problem they were going to invent that was equally as important for like God to love you or not love you or, you know, like exactly. Yeah. But to, having- to that point too, though, about like, do you guys remember the times when you would be doing stuff and having fun with your friends? And at the end of the night, you knew you were maybe a little on like a, an edge of mm-hmm. what would be considered propriety propriety. And you all kind of look at each other like nobody's we're all good, right? Like this is <laughs> we're not nobody's going to, you know, and it was almost like this sort of confess. <laughs> yeah, there was almost like this always this worry that like if, if you know, you're going to wind up having somebody snitching to elders about how you know something borderline inappropriate took place even if nobody's like really doing anything bad nobody's you know like mainlining heroin while uh (laughs) you know on top of a pile of hookers right like you're just kids hanging out but you all have to worry about if like you hang out a little too much fun and then oh shoot somebody's gonna tell a dang elder and then you're in trouble we have this did that ever happen with you guys (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we had this dude, um, you know, if you're old Wood River congregation alumni and checking in on what Anthony's doing, I'm going to name drop you there, Casey. Um, Casey was this guy. <laughs> he would hang out with us and he'd be all in the mix doing whatever. And again, it was nothing bad. It was, we were watching a rated R David Lynch movie or something and couples were sitting too close on the couch. It was nothing. It was no like drugs or adult or fornication or anything like that. But he he would inevitably be the one the next day to feel bad about it and then go narc us out to the elders just because he felt guilty. <laughs> it's like, well, if you got to get some sins off your chest, brother, go get them out. But don't drag us into this, you know. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're just trying to watch a race for head. But what is this a race for head? We're going to have to watch that. <laughs> you know, it's like, please don't elders. You won't get it. <laughs> But I would love just, it if a group of, if a body of elders was forced to watch a racer head against their will, though, to investigate something. Yeah. That would be awesome. You should include that scene in your next book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted to do a test. Yeah. Oh, God. I just say don't include a racer head in anything. That movie's weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Ryan, I was I pitched um, before you came on an idea, just a random idea for our October push, right? We're doing our crowdfund mega, bring all the artists, push all the shows and artists and books and music to the top. Um, have a, how, how, what can we do for Anthony? First thing comes to mind, just as a, it's not a test. It's like a brainstorm. Oh, that, that's a question for me. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Oh boy. I wasn't ready for that. Um, (laughs) What do we do for Anthony? Well, for one thing, um, Anthony, is there any chance you have residual copies of anything that you've written before that you need to get out there? Out of the closet and into the world? Absolutely not. The only thing the only thing is I am gonna this this will put the little this will put the little match under my foot to like um republish uh happiness before October, which isn't a big deal. It's it's ready to go. I just got to yeah. republish it under a new okay. imprint, nuclear gopher. <laughs> um, it sounds like we just got some planning and work to do there, my friend. Beautiful. We can at least do pre sales, and we'll it's, ship it's, we'll ship it, it in November. <laughs> yeah, we'll ship in November after after the crowdfund is complete. So you have two months. And then you can get the Jehovah's Witness romance novel with all the hot J.C. Penny action you want. <laughs> oh, speaking of J.C. Penny, get your catalogs. niche craved to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna. The other person I wanted to mention was Tony Duchesne. Have Have you both seen Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk? 
or I've read, read his the novel. Book, but I haven't seen it. Okay. Um, the novel's <laughs> awesome, and everyone should go buy his book because that directly supports Tony, and he's an amazing ex witness. He's super funny, and he runs an incredible plug in. He runs an incredible podcast that's just for authors. He's an author, he interviews authors, and he does a free writing co- course through the UCLA Extension. But um, it's called Drinks with Tony, and it used to be in a bar, and then it turned into a cafe, and now it's like, I think it's a cafe thing. Anyway, um, he, he wrote that book, Confessions of Teenage Jesus Jerk, and a big name director was his, his first documentary. can't remember the guy's name at the moment. And it's actually in, distributed Stoltz. with indie rights. Eric Stoltz, thank you. And actually, I think I saw this. Um, is, is the film we're talking about today, Anthony, um, Dope Men, is that uh, indie rights distribution? That is. Um, is. Okay, Dope cool. Men's indie rights... We have another documentary I haven't talked about. It's called Nightlife. It's about a violence interrupter in North St. Louis that goes out kind of odd hours of the the weekends and you know just tries to help people, but mostly just um, stop gang violence and stuff before it kicks off in the street. That's called Nightlife. That's also indie rights and it's available on Amazon, YouTube, Google, Apple, and then there's an there's uh, at least two others that are coming out from Outlaw Films through Indie Rights. Um, Psychedelic Revolution, which is about um, the origins or, of you know LSD uh, from the people that were there in the 60s and 70s. That one's coming out, and there's another one coming out. It's called um, A Tortured Mind. And it's mainly about a, uh, a an author who's no longer with us, is Ryan Leone, um, who had substance abuse problems and also spent some time in the feds and a tortured mind's about post-incarceration syndrome. You know, people that had problems going into prison um, weren't given the help they needed and basically kicked back out to the wolves after their release. And, you know, drug abuse was worse. Uh, PTSD was worse because of the prison violence and, and things like that. So that's called a tortured mind. So wow. that's at least four coming out through indie rights. Um, the two, Dope Men and Nightlife, are, are out right now and, through them. And these are ones that you have been involved with? Very loosely involved with them. I was mainly involved with Dope Men. Uh, beyond that, um, my involvement in the other projects has been just more just consultation just being part of the team this is good oh i like this so try this sort of thing so valuable feedback you know, yeah, yeah and then i've done i do i do some social media like little reels and little promo teasers and stuff for those those films but that's cool i wasn't involved in the actual making of those i wanted to just but going forward i'm going to be just more involved with doing animation and art our direction for future documentaries coming out through outlaw films. And that's building on kind of what you learned through dope men with bringing your graphic novel art into the animation for the movie that like build off. Exactly. Of that. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to mask or after effects and anytime you launch a whole new Adobe product, it's, it's like deep. the skills, the skills aren't transferable from one to the other. Yeah. You know, I've been, been doing social media work using Premiere Rush, which, you know, nice and easy. And then I get into Premiere and it's like all new tool sets. And then After Effects is its own new beast. So, you know, with I'm, if you need I'm, me, Premiere, I'm help. learning. I want to do a course and I think I might just start with like showing tools on my channel because other people can be can just find that and use it but maybe i'll put a course together at some point if you want to collaborate if you want to like a if you have a question i'm available for premiere stuff i beat my head against the wall until i'm now i feel like an expert <laughs> i built every documentary every episode of everything in premiere over the last five years seven years yeah i'm, I'm such a noob with it like today i was like trying to figure out how to you know split a clip or something and it's like i had a hunt and hunt and go online oh you gotta look for this little razor icon over here yeah that's the one you need. Or the C key. Oh, okay. yeah. Or the C, you know, I haven't even learned it's the short keys short yet, keys. but it's like, oh, that's what that is. That's a razor blade. Oh, I get it. Cutting film. Okay. It's but, funny because I took a whole course on how to use Premiere and I wrote the, the guy, yeah. I was like, I don't understand how to cut anything. This is fundamental. <laughs> I, right? I did like, I just like a half an hour trying to find the razor blade. It's so funny that like, once you know it's there, of course, you know, it's there, but <laughs> I think that's funny. Well, with After Effects, oh, go it's going to be like... No, go ahead. no, you. You're the guest. I was just going to say with After Effects, the thing I want to do is like when we did the, the Dopeman <clears throat> documentary, 
and using the comic art, you know, we made it where you can, you know, the things move around, you know, the background's parallaxed and all that. But I actually want to get to where, you know, I've got people's arms moving and going from 2D to movement and After Effects. You know, that's my goal. Um, but it's I've been watching online tutorials and it's it's pretty in depth. But you'll we'll get see there. how it goes. Yeah. Hmm. What, I want to say something about indie rights. I I feel like. I have this education <clears throat> that came from trying to distribute Witness Underground that could be a valuable that someone list could be valuable to someone listening. Is that there's like over a thousand distribution companies and indie rights is talked about a lot with a lot of positive um people love working with Linda Nelson and her team. And I kept on hearing about them, I kept reading about them, I was skeptical. But I kept on getting like sent her way until I finally submitted it to Indie Rights as like, well, how, how has this not been the first option? I've gotten three predatory bad deals on my table and I, they, I'm so pissed that, that I'm the one. I paid for a guy to help me with this and I have to be the one to navigate whether or not it's a good deal. And um, I did. And it, was, it took me like a year to figure out that Indie Rights was the one. In the end, her teammate turned it down and... And then, but Linda still gave me a call and she's like, well, it was my teammate and I trust her implicitly. She's been doing this for 30 years. So if she says it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, but I'm happy to have a call with you. Let's talk for talking. And she's like, let me just look it up. I don't know anything about your movie. Oh, I see. It's about music. Oh, we we're terrible at music documentaries. We've never made a dime with those. Like, that's why it's not like we, it's not like we don't want your film. It's probably a great film. I'm sure. But we want to both be able to make money, right? Like we haven't successfully figured that out. And then she looked at the website and she's like, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, I distributed Tony Duchesne's film, Confessions of a Teenage Jesus Jerk. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's amazing. Like I just had breakfast with Tony. <laughs> like that's so cool. I had no idea that that film's distributed. It's like my favorite film in the whole space on the topic of Witnesses. I think it's hilarious. And there's a JC Penny catalog moment that's so funny. And there's like this, the two j witnesses in service rubbing their legs together. And like it's sort of portrayed like <laughs> was with this blowjob in the film. <laughs> and it's like, oh, for sure. It's like this sexual experience in going door to door, <laughs> touching thighs through cotton. Um, anyway, so <laughs> Linda and I are having this whole conversation about how awesome that film is and laughing. And then she's, she's like, I think the right move is, is film hub for your film, but like the problem is finding the audience. And she said like, you need, you really need like a million views. Otherwise it's just not really financially viable. So try to find a million X witnesses. You probably need to break beyond the boundaries of the X witness world, which I hope we can do. And for everyone involved in this X witness world, like, yeah, we have this obvious connection, but we need to move our art outside the community. If we want it to like, make a global impact of some kind, maybe. But anyway. Well, and I think Witness Underground does that successfully. I mean, I've showed it to people that don't have Witness backgrounds at all, and it resonates with them. So I do think there's an audience for it. And from what I understand, I'm not involved in the distribution angle on Outlaw Films, but I talked to Seth a lot about it. And it's, it's tough these days. It's tough. And, you know, fortunately he was able to get in with indie rights because he did his research too on the, the thing. And they, they, they're like you said, they're the name that always comes up. They make the same deal as, as film hub. And, and actually, actually paying. Yeah. They work for it. They're, they're real people working for it. Where film hubs, like they have a team of people that get your stuff on other platforms, but they're not, I don't know. It's a, it's a very different model. It's, it's distribution versus aggregation. And that's the thing I'm learning. So we're going the aggregation route because the distributors are saying they don't think they can make money with it, which is fine. Then it's on us to make the money with it and like push and do the marketing, which is what we're all kind of talking about. Like, how do we, how do we elevate um, the content that we're making in this space um, or about these topics or what about the, how do you elevate these stories? Like, can we get Anthony's books out there and will they resonate with non former cult members? <laughs> I, I honestly think uh, people, that we, sorry, I was just going to say for your question there, Scott, I, I just, I think that this, in my experience, witness underground has already resonated more with people who have no connection to the witnesses than to witnesses in uh, just more often. I think more, more people are already, 
let me put it this way. Most people are already, if they're a witness or they're an ex-witness, they're already in a baked position about the whole concept. They're not going to get a lot mm. of enlightenment out of the movie. Uh, true, an yeah. actual witness might if they're on the edge and they need a push or something. But the the people who see the movie who go in blind with no preconceptions about Jehovah's Witnesses or about, and they've never heard of this stuff, they don't like weird outsider art music, whatever – and then watch the movie, they get insight and new new information in a way that the people inside the community don't get. And I, everybody who's like really kind of, you know, the majority of the people who have really kind of responded to the movie strongly that I've interacted with, where they've had the strongest reactions, weren't witnesses ever. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just about audience size, but it's about what the film actually does. If I watch a, watched a movie about this and it was about, I don't know, Scientologists, and I don't know anything about their culture internally, and I've never been one, but I watch the movie and it would resonate with me because of sympathetic vibrations on different things that I experienced as a witness or, you know, other kind of thing like mm -hmm. that. So I just, I think, you know, if you only showed, you know, polar bear documentaries to people who already loved polar bears, it's not going to be any fun and that's not your audience. It's everybody. <laughs> so why should this be limited to the specific, you know, audience yeah. of uh, people who happen to have left a cult that only has 7 million members in the first place? Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't, I'm, I'm just so biased towards the documentary, like very, very biased towards it. So I don't know that my opinion matters, but I, I love it. I absolutely love what you did with it. I mean, shoot, I watched it like three or four times, you know, almost over successful four days just because like, I don't know, it put everything in perspective for me. Like it just, everything suddenly made sense in ways wow. that, you know, I hadn't, mainly just because I hadn't thought about it in forever. I was content to just, uh, all right, we're going on with our lives now. Oh, what's that witness thing? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a bridge I burned years ago. I don't want to go back. I don't want to relive that trauma. I don't want to relive those memories. But the word cathartic is, is used too often in these conversations. But, you know, it, it was really powerful for me, the doc. And if you haven't uh, watched it already, like, please, please support the Patreon check it out because I, I think it's amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. I'm excited for the whole world to see it. That's the, that's the goal, right? One way or another, I want people to know about it. Right. I think it'll affect change. I'm not change. familiar with. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. Film hub. Uh, is that just another distribution place or something so, like that? So the difference in distribution and aggregation distribution has real people who have real relationships at all the streaming services. And they champion mm -hmm. your film. They believe that it has value and they're picking up lots of films. So at some point they have a library and they can't, de they, their time and energy and love is divided between how big their library is. Mm -hmm. Ultimately it's about going in and selling that film because they really understand it. They really think it has value or social impact or, um, or they think they can make good money on it because it has many good elements as of just as a piece of entertainment um, or an aggregator, just they have kind of blanket deals and they're, they basically built a soft, this particular one built a software and it's sort of like, yeah, we have business relationships with these groups. And if you, anyone could submit to them and they will put it in front of the people at those businesses. And those people might read the sentence about the film, the log line. They might look at the poster art. They might watch the trailer. And at any point they might just stop doing any of that. And they might actually watch it if they are intrigued enough. Um, but they don't have someone saying, we love this film. I think this is perfect for your channel which is the difference. It's a different kind of relationship. And it's on me to sort of sell it properly, which is why I've been like, let's get the copy correct. Like, let's, this is our only chance of someone reading this sentence. It needs to hook them. Uh, so it's been a long, slow thing because we're doing the irrigation route. Yeah. Right. I, I hear that. And I hear it from Seth and other people that it's just, it's, it's a whole new world out there of how this all works, you know, with streaming and stuff and the traditional ways aren't working and no one kind of really knows what's the best new way to do it. And, mm -hmm. but I don't know, I have faith in the project and I, I think we'll, we'll get that audience. Yeah. I kind of had to switch recently, which was, I was reading these like standard film release 
pathways and they're all like, well, you have a 90 day window and it's, you know, like, well, Barbie came out and like, how did they do it? It's just like that copy Barbie's yeah. model, um, get it into theaters and then do a four or do a four wall yourself or you buy the theater, buy all the seats and you yeah. sell the tickets yourself and then you promote for a month in advance and you hit the targeted, you do this whole like thing. And it doesn't make any sense for a social impact documentary. Like there's a hundred thousand ish people leave this religion every year. This is going to be a slow burn and there's going to be people having going back to this thing. Your people don't watch documentaries more than once. Usually you people that watch this documentary repeatedly say something like you, like I watched it twice. I watched it three times. You said this is the first time I think someone said they watched it four times. And it's like all, would you say like right back to back, like in the same few days? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I watched it. I watched it again. <laughs> I just kept watching it, man. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's interesting, right? Like that's not normal. <laughs> not that you're not normal, but like, that's not how usually people deal with documentaries. Like I, I really enjoyed. Oh Dope yeah. Man. I, I will, I have watched it. I mm -hmm. got it and it was good, but I know I'll tell people about it because it's a good film. No, but like with outlaw, with outlaw films and what Seth's trying to do, I mean, a large part of his thing is activism with dope men. You know, he's trying to tell the story of the, how this, this crazy war on drugs started mm -hmm. with psychedelic revolution. You know, it's not just talking about the history of LSD. It's taught bringing it into the modern era of how, you know, it's being used now and in, in different clinical studies, you know, to, to do things. Um, he's got tangled roots, which is about, you know, the legacy cannabis growers in Northern California that are getting squeezed out by the commercialization of cannabis oh. by big agriculture. Is that, on, you is know? that a series that's uh, streaming right now? I just watched something like uh, that. Tangled roots is, it's not out just okay. yet. It's, it, it'll be out, I think early next year. Um, okay. but it's about Humboldt County, what they call the Emerald triangle, it's like a lot of these malcontents from the 60s, the hippie era, went up there and kind of homesteaded. And and during the years of Prohibition, they really, really crafted some good cannabis, you know, that became, you know, the premier cannabis. But now that, you know, big ads coming in, it's it's no longer the boutique cannabis growers now. You know, it's yeah. the big industrial growers. And, and unfortunately, these people that perfected a lot of these strains and did so, you know, versus the risk of incarceration all that year, you know, they're kind of getting squeezed to the side. Right. And, you know, can Humboldt County kind of become the Napa Valley of cannabis, you know, where people who are super into it, you know, want to have like the very best, you know, and, and you know, go, go farm to farm or whatever, right. whatever it's going to be. But just, you know, it's, it's a film about looking out for, for the, the, the little guys, so to speak, the people that really champion cannabis throughout these long years of prohibition. And now that many states are legalizing, you know, it's like, OK, we can't let these people get left in the dust because they pay the ultimate price to, to get it to where it's at now. Yeah. Anyway, that's what that film's about. So interesting. You know, another thing that br that brings up is we have so many incarcerated Americans, like it's 24% of the planet's prisoners are Americans and most of them are non-victim criminals. And a lot of it has to do with marijuana usage, not even selling. So like possession of marijuana. Actually, the, he ever uh, talk about the, like sorry. getting those people out of prison or is there any, you know, any movement to like have a change in that space? Well, Seth's really into that because, you know, he's, as I mentioned, he spent 21 years locked up uh he was non-violent you know they called him a kingpin but he really wasn't he was just dealing to old high school buddies at various colleges on the east coast wow you know he got a 21 year sentence um for distributing cannabis and lsd and you know he was locked up you know he's a white guy locked up but for every seth ronte in the prison you know there was 10 20 30 black guys locked up you know for for crack in the inner city and or or just cannabis in the inner city. So, you know, his whole thing is like the war on drugs, you know, yeah, it filled the prisons. It made a lot of money for people, but was it the right thing to do, you know, to take away someone's life over a nonviolent crime, especially something that's involving cannabis, something that's, like I said, legal. in I guess it's most States now to various extents. And also like with LSD coming and, and psychedelics and mushrooms and things like that, that's even starting to open up mm -hmm. and, you know, people are giving the second look. Can we use this to treat PTSD? Can we use this to treat, you know, cluster headaches or migraines or, you know, whatever someone's suffering with? 
So that's kind of been his advocacy. You know, the war on drugs, it's failed. It was it was a wrong thing that happened in society. And, you know, what can we do now to change things that affect change to, you know, get these nonviolent offenders, you know, another chance at life and without all these heavy mandatory sentences that were imposed during kind of the the Reagan era for. There's a great point made in Dopeman about the self um, rejuvenating uh, trend of illicit narcotics or any kind of illegal substance that people have, there's a demand for, is that as soon as the person at the top is gone who's making all the money uh, and there's incentive to get rid of them because then someone else fills, there's always someone to fill the spot. And anytime it gets taken yeah. out, there's now there's a void. Okay, there's well, there's people that want this product, so people are going to deliver that product, especially when there's they're well incentivized monetarily to do so. And it's been that way, as the film describes, since prohibition. And that was a bunch of rich elites who were using alcohol and drugs, made it illegal, mm-hmm. so they could, and then they maintained this illegal. They they created the illegal market, right? which means they had to have an illegal military or pay people off or work with the government and do all this nefarious stuff that we have to this day, like legalize. It's actually, we're in this like beautiful Renaissance that was like peaking in the late sixties with um, psychedelics, especially that we we've lost those older, the people that kept it alive. We've lost, we're losing that knowledge and it's amazing to have it come back what it took, you know, since the sixties. So how many years is that? 60 years of, of, missed yeah. um, human knowledge, lost human knowledge. Um, okay. I actually had been wanting to mention while we're waiting for Anthony, I had been wanting to mention one on the topic of the marijuana. The A um, couple of years back, there was a documentary made from Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire. and Oh yeah, the series on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I guess it was, it was before marijuana legalization came to Minnesota, but I don't know how many years ago it was. Maybe it was only three or four years, but I, there was a PBS one that was made as well. Um, but it's fascinating because when they go into talking about marijuana, they talk about, you know, how that what Anthony was saying, you know, like people de- dedicated such ingenuity and resources and time and attention to various cultivars and strains and learning how to like manipulate this plant in this sort of, Mm -hmm. because the plant was providing us with the fulfillment of the desire for our sort of the psychoactive component. And then we're providing the plant with whatever it will want. And it's such an interesting plant because it like will take all the UV you can throw at it. It like can be really mutated into different shapes and forms and manipulated in interesting ways. And for all of that work to have been done under cover of darkness, off in the shadows with potential life sentences, and then to have big pharmaceutical companies being able to come in and take, you know, oh, yep, I'll take that fantastic Kush there. I'll take that amazing Indica there. And they can just take the all that results of all that hard work and they can monetize it and sell it is is a little bit infuriating. Like, yeah, it's, well, it's more than a little bit infuriating, but, you know, especially, I mean, my God, people who served massive terms of incarceration for growing a goddamn plant that was also cultivated by the founding fathers is bizarre, right? It, like, yeah, it just very, makes very no strange. sense at all. And, right. And yeah. it doesn't, I mean, people like probably shouldn't operate heavy machinery on it, but it no. chills people out. Like people aren't doing violent crimes on or for marijuana. They're like, let's relax and like have good vibes and yeah. like chill. And like, it, how is yeah. that the one that's so, so such a problem? It, it's, Meanwhile, well, like meth, it's the gateway, opium. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's the well, idea is no, that that's what they say. No, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm yeah. not saying it is. I'm saying that was the <laughs> argument. The argument right. was, Oh, sure. You just start with the wacky weed, but before you know it, you've got us, you've got a spike in your arm, you know? And it's like, okay, maybe that's true for some people that they Mm -hmm. did use the one before graduating to the others, but some people just drank and then wound up in an opium den in the 1800s, you know, like pick it. It's not about the chemical. It's about the person and it's about whether or not they are, uh, you know, have have an addictive um, constitution, 
in many cases. Mm -hmm. Some people are more constitutionally prone to addiction. It runs in families. There's statistics and genetics and research. It can often be tied to trauma experiences yes, as well. It can be that as well. And in yeah. in any case, I mean, criminalizing a plant is a weird thing. I don't know why <laughs> the United States decided to do that, but I'm glad they're undoing it. I'm glad it's it's come to my state. Yeah, congratulations, Minnesota. <laughs> yes. Good work, guys. I watched a, a series on the same topic recently in California, especially they're talking about the taxation laws to get legalization for the plant. And the reason why big pharma is coming in, they probably had something to do with those laws because it's incredible. It's an incredible hurdle for small time um, companies to make it because the way things are taxed, banking is illegal because it's a federal thing and all the banks are federal. So they can't actually, it's illegal to put their money into banks Mm -hmm. So they have, but they can make 60 right. to hundred K a month. So they have piles of cash, but then just protect the cash. They have to hire gun armed gunmen because they're getting robbed and raided for their money or their product all the time. And so they have to hire these, this like basically underground military or security force. Plus they can't use banks. So they have to buy property to launder the money, but they have to launder the money and that's legal. They can do that because it's in the state. You can use that money to do things and it's legal money. But then they have to pay this like crazy tax, but the taxation is on the gross, not the net. So they have to pay tax on the gross while hiring employees with that same oh money. So like out of a hundred dollars for every hundred dollars they make, they only actually get like 40 after the taxation and the employee costs and all, and then the healthcare and all the stuff they have to provide legally. It's like this crazy. Well, isn't that kind of I, what happens though? If like over the years in order to stem to, in order to fight the drug war, they put up all these different types of laws, right? Lots and lots of regulations, lots of things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Well, just going ahead and making legalization a fact doesn't take all those other regulations down de facto. So all of a sudden you're, you know, what you're, you're pointing out, like all those unintended, you know, straggler things that now also need to get changed in order to, mm -hmm. okay, yep, no, you can use a bank. Okay, now you don't need a private militia, right? Now, like, that won't come for years yet. Right. Because yeah, it's just, already into this for decades, and it's still yeah. a problem, right? Yeah. And this and, is why big companies are able to swoop in and, like, take market share. Yep. Because they have the money behind them already. They're not working from needing to make profit off of this year's crop like a normal farmer or a small-time ones. Yep. Well, also, you have to, you know, at least in where I've seen in Michigan, I haven't visited any any in Minnesota um, yet, but in Michigan, hey. I've been to dispensaries and uh, also in California. In both cases, they always have to have like a lab tested, certified, controlled process, right? Like for for that. And that's not the same as a you know, vegetable stand on the corner for your CSA or whatever either. Right. Right. So yeah, the barriers to entry and the barriers to success are pretty high. That is going to make it more difficult for the small folks, uh, you know, the startups, but Anthony, while well, you popped off, we were carrying the torch on the topic of marijuana and challenges for the small farmers. <clears throat> yeah, I just hope people, you know, who are interested in, you know, mafia, True Crime, Lucky Luciano, The War on Drugs, etc. Check out Dope Men. It's available on, like I said, Amazon, Apple, YouTube, Google Play, you know, wherever you can buy and rent films. Um, hopefully in the future, you know, it'll go on a streaming service like Tubi, but we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Um, especially if you have a Kindle, check out that the Lucky Graphic Novel by Christian Cipollini and Yevigny Francev. It took a decade to make. Um, it's really kind of unique as far as a graphic novel. Um, it's not just the, the comic book. That's a huge part of it, telling the story of Lucky Luciano's life. Uh, Christian Cipollini, he's the foremost expert on this guy. He lives and breathes Lucky Luciano. So it's highly detailed. We've got articles in there. We've got essays. We've got behind the scenes. We've got, you know, everything about the subject and beyond. So it's really a cool book. I'm really happy with how it came together and, and definitely encourage people who are into comics, graphic novels, Lucky Luciano, The Mob, True Crime, you know, definitely take a look at that one. I never read graphic novels, and I was fully sucked in. I think he did, he did a great job. 
and I oh, was you. really enjoying it. I, I want to finish it. Yeah. Um, I read a lot of this? graphic novels and I'm very excited about this one. I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to probably today or tomorrow. Yeah. I like the artist Would in you the say book. He's 10 year project. Go ahead. No, it just takes a lot of time to do it. I mean, hand it, it's, you know, a hand drawing, all that stuff. And the artist, Yevgeny, he, he's, he's a, he's a Russian, you know, his, his background isn't, you know, America 1920s, you know, but he watched a lot of, you know, Goodfellas and Godfather and all this stuff to learn how to draw the cars and the gangsters and stuff. Uh, by the end of the 10 year project, we joke, you know, like none of us want to uh, draw a fedora again in our lives. <laughs> because, like, <laughs> it's like, uh, it, comic books, it, it takes time, especially, you know, when it's, it's not somebody's full time job, you know, it's more of a side hustle thing, you know, that you got to squeeze in. So I, I'm just, I'm thrilled to see that project to its completion. Uh, because it's one thing to start something, it's another thing to finish it. And, you know, whether it took one year or 10 years, I'm just so, so pleased that it's out, not just for the sake of Christian and the artist and the rest of us involved, but really it started as a Stash publishing project. And even though uh, that comic creator group that I was in Stash, even though we're no longer together doing it, it's nice to see some of these books live on and not just, you know, fall by the wayside. Is this your biggest work or have you got a collection that came before this one? Oh, this is the one I probably spent the most time with. But when we were involved with Stash, we did I maybe like 10 anthologies um, that were pretty sizable books. Now, an anthology is just a bunch of short comics, you know, maybe four, six, eight pages in length okay. around a, a central theme, be it horror, crime or whatever it was. I did those. I helped produce some graphic novels for some people, a book called Z Day, a book called Lost Owl Kingdom, which is kind of post apocalyptic zombie type stuff. So I worked I worked on a lot of comics. I wish I could say I have a graphic novel of my own, you know, that I wrote and all that, and I hope to have that one day with Hemingway. But that's an even we were so ambitious with that project. It's all hand done, it's all hand watercolored. The 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 lettering, the word balloons, wow. normally you do that, you know, with like Illustrator, some other digital format, you know, those are all hand lettered and all, you know, it's all done by hand. Wow. So we're kind of at the cusp of like, you know, maybe one, two years before AI um, can do a comic book. So it's kind of cool to maybe in this era with something that's more of a old, old, old school, you know, very little computers involved in it at all all done by hand so that one's that's the best one i've ever done i hope to see it finished just because it's just such a beautiful piece of art and super historically researched and you know we've got nazis in there and him it's hemingway beating up nazis what what more does anyone want in a comic book? <laughs> <laughs> i'd read that <laughs> so that one's coming yeah hopefully and where where can we follow your work so we we can get can we get we can get lucky now, right? As a digital version yeah. of the book, or, or like, like a very the hard, hard cover. Yeah, there's a hard cover okay. out. It's strictly collectors. It's it's got a really high price tag. Um, there'll be a soft cover that's more affordable coming out. But the best way for a person to read it is on Kindle, I think. Unless they're a super avid lucky fan, then by all means get that fancy limited edition hard cover. But check that out. Where can people follow me? Um, you can come out to the woods and say hi, maybe fly an airplane overhead and wave. I'm, I I kind of <laughs> went through this phase where I kind of I went off the Internet. I did. I, you know, I, I dropped all my social media accounts and I haven't reestablished them just because I've been uh, Scott. What you call it? Dagobah mode. <laughs> yeah. And Dagobah on like Yoda <laughs> on the swamp planet. Yeah. I, <laughs> In the Arkansas you know, that, forest planet. Yeah, I had I had a good I had a good decade where, you know, I was out of the witnesses and I ran really, really hard and had a lot of adventures, a lot of ups and downs, you know, good things, bad things and everything in between. And just it was a time to get away to the woods and, and figure some stuff out. And so and this is the first time I've been on a podcast in years. So uh, people oh, cool. want to follow. 
uh, what I'm doing, I don't know. I guess I guess tune into this channel and we'll have to update people. But like, if people want to check out Gorilla Convict just on Instagram, Gorilla Convict, um, or Instagram, uh, Seth Ferrante, F E R R A N T I, and also on YouTube, Seth Car Ferrante's True Crime. We're getting ready to launch, um, relaunch his channel with like some mini video articles and, and all sorts of cool stuff. Very cool. Well, I'm going to put the links to watch Dopeman. It's America's first, America's first cartel. Drug and cartel. to watch that on Amazon or other, or other places. And the link to the Kindle version of the, the book and a link to, for the collectors, for the hard copy. And Thank you. Seth Ferranti's work, which it sounds like you're supporting him in a number of ways. It's not just this one project. Um, his, his, that story is amazing. I'm so thank you for sharing. I had no idea. And I think it's like really compelling to even, even when you're trapped in prison or in a cult, you can still make something. <laughs> Seth Ferranti exactly. made a, wrote a bunch of content telling stories from within prison. That's how he became famous. It was the general idea. Yeah. Like I said, it's like, you know, he's proof um, that, you know, any kind of obstacle that life throws your way, you can, you can use it and turn it around and, and build something good out of it. And I think that should resonate with anybody who feels like they've been trapped in the Jehovah's Witness religion way too long with their life on hold. You know, it's it's a prison of a different sort. And, you know, I feel mm -hmm. like that's why his story resonated with me. Um, he's an inspiration on that 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 mode for me, too. And that's that's why I enjoy uh, working with him and, you know, helping him out with his projects. Very cool. I have, a, I have a problem with my website, which is I have so much art to share, but I would like to find a place to host this kind of content of yours. Um, I, this particular content that we're talking about, I'll try to find a place to put it on the website as like, here's how you can go watch the film and buy the book. And then for your future content, when you come out, we'll make sure we can have a spot to like find your cool. work since you're not really on the internet otherwise especially <laughs> should I well, get back on or the we get a, we could get some sort of communal flight together to fly over Anthony's place. Yeah. With the big, bananas. some skydiving friends that could kick us out the window, kick us yeah. out the door. Yeah. I like this idea. Let's do it that way. The witnesses found me out in the woods. So I guess other people can as well. <laughs> Ex witnesses had better be able to find you then. Is they did. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I got a very they nice letter. So enjoying their hot chocolate. In the I was I was just oh. uh, we, we we have to use wood to heat so I, I burn all my junk mail and I opened up this letter and out falls a track I forgot what the track was secret of family happiness or something like that <laughs> so I got <laughs> yep, in contact with know. the guy right. <laughs> and I was like hey man I'm out here building a paradise you want to come help no nah, no nah. we just want we just want to talk about it around for... we don't want to we don't actually go ahead and, <laughs> and build one with you it's like okay well I'm I'm super witness <laughs> because. You know, I always thought my future would be cleaning up an apocalyptic wasteland and turning it into paradise, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that every you time I'm out there that. Picking, picking up like a beer can or just some junk on the property left behind by someone. It's like, yeah, I'm cleaning up the earth, just like I always thought I'd do. Every time I plant a flower, yeah, I'm building paradise. <laughs> 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 that's a beautiful awesome. way to look at it i like that i like that yeah all my hopes and dreams everyone all your hopes and dreams everything pleasure, you want to do in life you will end up doing in your life so just set your intentions make sure they're good intentions make sure that it's what you want to do in life and then just keep walking towards it sometimes you'll take baby steps sometimes you'll take huge leaps where you ramp up to the next level just just stay the course and your dreams no matter how much they've been curtailed in your life, your dreams will come true. Hell yeah. That was a great finish. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was Thanks, awesome. Anthony. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. See you in the next one, everybody. Yep. Thanks, Ryan. Bye.